2001 saw SpongeBob's video game debut with Legend of the Lost Spatula. Later in the year, the series received two new games just a few days apart. With Operation Krabby Patty coming out on the 24th, Super Sponge just barely beat it for the title of SpongeBob's second game by coming out on the 20th in the U.S. They were initially advertised together, even though they were on different platforms and made by different people. It was developed by Climax Group for the PlayStation and Game Boy Advance, but today we'll be looking at the PlayStation version. If Climax Group sounds familiar to you, it might be because they later became Climax Studios and went on to develop Silent Hill Origins and Shattered Memories. Also the handheld versions of Nicktoons Unite, magnum opus right there. Now obviously, Spongebob is completely different territory than Silent Hill, so let's see how they did with Super Sponge and see if it holds up. But, there's one more thing I have to mention. If we're going to talk about Super Sponge, there's an elephant in the room that I can't ignore. On old development CDs, along with some silly notes and information logging Super Sponge's creation, some very unusual images were found. Images of Spongebob characters engaging in acts that aren't exactly conventional for a Nickelodeon show. If you really want to see them for whatever reason that may be, they come up quickly if you look them up. But just to give you an idea, here's a close-up of a few faces from the pictures. Yeah, I don't think the name Climax Group was a coincidence. So now that we've relieved ourselves of mentioning that burden, let's get on with the game. It opens with some show clips that introduce the main characters. We also get a taste of the game's music, which is actually really good. There are some fantastic tracks in this. Listen to some of these. This is also the first Spongebob game to have voice acting. I know we all wish we could have heard Plankton say all I want is Krabby Patty in real time, so this is good to have. Unfortunately, it is easy to accidentally skip over because you have to press the D-pad down to continue the on-screen dialogue, but if you press the X button on Instinct, you'll end up skipping it. One thing I noticed right away is that a lot of voice lines for more generic statements are reused throughout the AWE PC series. My guess is that they were pre-recorded and provided by Nickelodeon for developers to use. Though it is kind of shocking to hear a character say the exact same thing in a completely different game. So moving on, it's Patrick's birthday and Spongebob wants to give him the best present imaginable. He goes to the Shady Shoals rest home to get an autograph from Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. They say they'll give it to you in exchange for a superhero sandwich, so Spongebob has to go on whole dangerous missions to find every individual ingredient. Hey, it's Spongebob logic. Another interesting note is that Mermaid Man is voiced by Ernest Borgnine in this. In most other games, he's voiced by either Joe Alasky or Joe White. I'm glad Ernest could fit this in his schedule. He's an absolute legend. So when we get to the gameplay, we see that the levels are compiled into five chapters. The first is Bikini Bottom, and we start with Jellyfish Fields, a good starting location for any SpongeBob game. You can also see the main character's houses in the background at the start. There's a sense of progress as you move forward, and I really like that about this. Just like in Battle for Bikini Bottom, the first character you meet in Jellyfish Fields when you get off a bus is Squidward. He sure likes this place for someone who hates jellyfishing. I mean, he did invent it, after all. He gives you your jellyfish net and tells you to go away. This is your first item, and in my opinion, the worst one of them all. You use it to catch jellyfish that are flying around, then you can throw them at enemies. But you can't aim it, you just kind of toss them on the ground in front of you and hope they hit something. The enemies will already be too close for comfort by the time you're in a good range. It's so much easier to just use your butt slam ability to crush them. I find it interesting that in most Spongebob games, jellyfish are enemies that hurt you. But in this, they only act as ammo for your net. 
Sometimes I'll mistake a jellyfish for an enemy and mess myself up because it's what I've been trained to do. I'll never forget the relentless bombardments from Legend of the Lost Spatula. You also collect golden spatulas. If you get hit, they fall out of you. If you get hit when you don't have any, you lose a life and start over from your last checkpoint. So yeah, this is basically a Spongebob version of Sonic the Hedgehog. If you collect a certain amount of golden spatulas in a single stage, you get a bonus round where you head to a theme park called Six Clams Adventureland. Obviously a parody of Six Flags. In these, you collect flowers around the park and you can use them to buy props for Patrick's birthday party at the very end. In some of them, you ride on a roller coaster and control Spongebob's cart to jump over obstacles. While this does give me horrifying memories of playing Operation Rail, this is a lot slower and easier to get the hang of than that. Though in the last one, you have to guide Gary to his food bowl while clearing obstacles for him, and I honestly can't even get past the first one. I've never been a big fan of escort missions because I'm personally terrible at them. Thankfully, it's just a bonus round. But if you're trying to collect the golden spatulas in a regular stage, be careful because there are enemies all over the place. Unlike in Legend of the Lost Spatula though, there are plenty of checkpoints in this. But like in Sonic the Hedgehog, you have to collect the spatulas again if you lose them. If you're close to the end of the stage and something hits you, that means it's time to restart. Though a lot of the difficulty, especially in later stages, comes during the sections where you jump from one platform to another. While it can just feel outright unfair in some sections, it's an acceptable challenge for the most part. It feels smooth when you jump, so you have control of where you land. A recurring issue I see with early Spongebob platformers is the jump controls are usually restricted and it's hard to reach moving platforms with them. Good on Climax for getting it right. The stages themselves are fun to go through and it's nice to see episode references that they slip in like this rock that looks like a snail shell. Though sometimes you'll meet a random 3D enemy that might be a bit unexpected. Again, they're just like AWE with their 2D 3D blend. These companies were made for each other. So once you find the jelly, you head to Sandy's Tree Dome for the C-Nut Butter. You need your water helmet, though it isn't visible on Spongebob. Your water is draining, so you need to jump in pools to refill it. You have to climb Sandy's tree by jumping to platforms and avoiding falling acorns. I had trouble with this at first, but after doing it once, I could do it easily on my second try. The farther you go, the more generous the game gets with how many pools it gives you. It's funny, because when you first start the stage, your helmet will be practically fully drained by the time you reach the second one. They just have to keep you on your toes. After that, you head to Fish Hooks Park. Shame they didn't call it the carnival. It's like jellyfish fields, except with fish hooks and more enemies. These squids are the bane of my existence. They're in the air, so it's hard to smash them, and they move really fast, so they'll almost always hit you. Squidward, tell your brethren to calm down. I know you're an octopus, but still, still a cephalopod. Lastly, you head downtown, which is the toughest stage of the first chapter. Hey, if we go in that jewelry store, we might find... Pretty jewelry. You have to keep the high ground because these boats will destroy you if you're on the street. Though even if you get the high ground, these squids will destroy you. You just can't win with this. Once you clear it, you reach the first boss, Mother Jellyfish. You read from Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy's superhero handbook to know how to defeat her, and to be honest, even though she's only the first boss, she's kind of the hardest. This is because you have to catch and fling jellyfish at her, but that requires getting close enough to aim. If you touch her or she stings you, you take damage. But she often blocks the center of the stage and it's hard to get around her. You might lose spatulas or waste jellyfish, but you can't get past her to collect more. You have to keep hitting her with jellyfish until she dies, then you bring the completed sandwich back to Shady Shoals. Honestly, you could have just won a typing tournament. The sandwich would have been just as good. So now Barnacle Boy sends you to find equipment to give Mermaid Man a facial. Obviously, this can only be found at the center of the earth. Why else do you think skincare is so hard? This is where the game really starts to get difficult. Here you meet Mr. Krabs and he gives you a coral blower. They don't call it a reef blower in this. To use the blower, you find a piece of coral or a seashell, then you suck it in. Then you hold the square button to aim it before firing it to smash a breakable wall. When wearing it, you can't do your butt smash or jump very high, so you often have to release it and find a new one after making your jumps. But be careful when you release it, because if you have coral or a shell inside, you lose it when you re-equip the blower. Like in the final bonus round, you also have an escort mission where you have to clear a path for Gary to reach his food bowl. You wouldn't want Gary to die, would you? This requires fighting these enemies on the ceiling that shoot at you in different directions at once. You can only defeat them by shooting at them with your blower, but it's hard to hit them because your aim has to be perfect. This requires getting extremely close to them before you shoot. But after the escort mission, you might be disappointed to find that it was just for an extra life. 
Don't get me wrong, lives are still extremely useful in this, especially when they have obstacles like these spikes that are easy to fall into, or this pitfall right here that's just cruel with its placement. Also, these skull blocks that smash you are terrible because they move gradually and just touching them can hurt you. Honestly, this one stage alone feels like it goes on for an entire chapter. It's probably the most detailed one in the entire game. It's a massive relief when you finally complete it. Ironically, the very next stage is so much easier. Patrick gives you a balloon that you can float with, so you can use it while jumping on bubbles to navigate caverns. Yeah, try jumping on bubbles in real life and see what happens. But this is a really fun stage. I like flying through the tunnels. So when you reach the air pocket stage, you're immediately hit by a falling boulder. Talk about a warm welcome. We also meet octopi that are just as bad as the squid from earlier. Jeez, what did we do to make Squidward send his whole extended family after us? They move up and down and can block off platforms you need to jump on. Thankfully, there's a way to beat them with a new item you can collect. If you find the bubble wand and bubbles for it, you can blow them and use them as platforms to jump on. This is one of my favorite mechanics. You can cross gaps, but you can also use it to get above enemies so you can butt slam them. Illogical as it may be, I love this item. Though I don't love the chasm crossing section of this stage very much, it is absolutely unforgiving. But once it's done, you head to the lava fields. Here, you can bounce on tires that somehow made it to the center of the earth. You know, come to think of it, how did any of this reach the center of the earth? I blame Plankton. Here, you also have to cross rivers of lava by running backwards on a barrel. Once you reach the opposite end, you have to jump forward so it can be confusing before you get the hang of it. Then you reach the second boss, the Sub Shark, one of Plankton's robots that went haywire. You have to collect a jelly launcher that shoots a limited supply of jellyfish. The shark flies around and dashes into you, and once it starts dashing, it's hard to avoid. I found this battle hard at first, but then I realized what I was doing wrong. You can shoot the shark with jellyfish, but you don't have a lot of ammo and the stage doesn't resupply you. I thought I had to restart whenever I ran out, but you can actually butt slam the shark to damage it too. Also, if you just stand on the back ledge and shoot whenever it comes into view, it won't even hit you. It's easy when you know what to do. So Spongebob brings the stuff back to the heroes, but he still isn't done. Barnacle Boy sends you to prehistoric Bikini Bottom to find new uniforms for him and Mermaid Man. It sounds like he's just trying to get rid of Spongebob, but then why doesn't he just give him an autograph and be done with it? How hard could it be? And you gotta hand it to Spongebob here. He's going to such extreme lengths to get this present for his friend. I get that he and Patrick are close, but all this for one simple birthday gift? I mean, if the developer images are anything to go by- You know what, never mind, I'm not gonna make that joke. So Spongebob goes to use Plankton's time machine, and Plankton doesn't mind as long as you fill it up before you return it. Then you go in the same time machine from SB129. Make sure you don't accidentally go to that alone place, that would be horrifying. We already went there in the Invader Zim game. But nah, for this first round, you fly on balloons through spiky caves and butt smash breakable platforms. Hey wait, why is Mr. Krabs here? He must have used his own time machine. Maybe he can only collect the Krabby Patty formula in the prehistoric ages. New theory. He gives you squeaky boots you can walk on spikes with, so I guess he didn't learn his lesson from the last time he gave Spongebob squeaky boots. The first stage is easy, and in the second you meet Sandy, who gives you a karate glove. Seriously, is every Spongebob character going back in time? I guess they're all determined to help you get that autograph for Patrick. The karate glove kinda sucks because it doesn't last long at all, and even though it's a handy weapon for close combat, it's still more efficient to butt smash. I barely ever get to use it before it disintegrates. The stage isn't too hard, but there's a neat fact about the next one. It's called the Kelpozoic Jungle, which was also a location in Legend of the Lost Spatula. There sure are a lot of similarities to the other 2001 games in this. Were Climax, AWE, and Vicarious Visions all working in the same studio or something? Also, Patrick's here now, so that nullifies my theory that everyone's working together to get his present. Again, another easy stage if you know what to do. Then you go inside a whale for the last one. Wow, they did a stomach-themed stage even before Creature from the Krusty Krab. The stomach acid can be a pain to work around, but once you get through it, you reach a boss. This whole chapter is very easy when compared to the one before it. Maybe this one should have come before the underground one. The boss is also easy, you just bounce around and butt slam it, nothing to it. When you return to Shady Shoals, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are hiding from you. Seriously, if they want you gone so much, all they have to do is write their name on a piece of paper. Why is that so hard for them? There's also a mistake in this. Barnacle Boy wants you to get his favorite kelp bar, and he says you can only get it in Bikini Bottom. He even emphasizes that. He actually means Rock Bottom. I like that the first stage is actually the process of climbing in 
into rock bottom, you jump across moving platforms that are really fun to navigate, though the shooting ceiling enemies absolutely suck in this. Once you reach the kelp bar machine, you find it's empty, so you have to keep looking. The next stage is called Lonely Souls, which as a name sounds really deep for a Spongebob game. It's this really cool creepy level where you jump across docks and ride rafts. The candy machine is also empty, so it's on to the graveyard. Here, you fight these creepy shrieking skulls. <laughs> Then you reach Last Stop, where you go underground. Then you meet your next boss, the Flying Dutchman. You stand somewhere, wait for him to appear behind you, then you shoot him with your jelly launcher. But it actually gets confusing when you defeat him. You're left wandering around with nothing to collect and nowhere to go. It might take you a bit to realize you have to ride a bubble all the way to the top of the screen to return to the surface. Then you can get the kelp bar from a working machine. But now you're locked outside the rest home. From the window, Barnacle Boy says the TV is broken, so he sends you to find tools to fix it in the very last chapter. Now it's off to Industrial Jellyfish Fields, a darker spin on the first level. Here, we meet- Oh, hey Man Ray. One of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy's biggest enemies just casually waltzing by. He only takes one hit to go down, and there's a whole bunch of him walking around in this chapter. This is like if the Joker appeared as a regular henchman in an Arkham game, especially without any context. In the next stage, you're actually in his lair, but since there are so many of him, I'm not even sure which Man Ray owns it. Maybe he cloned himself. I like the oil rig stage, because you're moving around all these tubes in a factory zone, but these fire obstacles are an instant death if they touch you. That's kind of harsh, because they're really easy to get hit by. They continue into the next stage, along with other gruesome hazards like these spinning blades. This final chapter is difficult if you're trying to collect all the spatulas, which are required to unlock the bonus round, but if you're just trying to win, it isn't too hard. Not even the final boss. It's an iron dogfish, something Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy have never seen before. Thankfully, to defeat it, all you need to do is hit these switches as it passes by. This'll stun it so you can butt slam it. Then when it's defeated and you get the monkey wrench, you can see this silly animation of Spongebob fixing the TV. The heroes are so thankful they give you the autograph, something they really should have done by now. And Barnacle Boy claims to have learned an important lesson about friendship. Such a happy ending, right? Then Spongebob leaves and the TV explodes, making Mermaid Man swear revenge. I guess he forgets about it because he and Barnacle Boy actually show up at Patrick's party. Isn't that just a little better than an autograph? Forget having their name on a piece of paper, your favorite celebrities just outright came to your birthday party. Also, this made me laugh way harder than it should have. Today's my birthday? Huh. I thought I was born a long time ago in a hospital. Then we get a segment of every character wishing Patrick a happy birthday. Just like in the AWE Jimmy Neutron game where every character congratulates you. Good job, Jimmy boy! Good job, Jimmy boy! Way to go, Jimmy! Always oh, my brightest student! Alright, Jimmy! Wow, I made an AWE reference that wasn't even a Spongebob game. These companies really do have a lot in common. Then after that, the credits roll. An ending that gives us exactly what we were fighting for. So yeah, I really enjoyed playing through this. The different mechanics make the stages worthwhile, and it's nice to see all the different things you can do. For such a straightforward concept, every level is filled with paths and features you can check out. With good details and a pleasant soundtrack, this is a really enjoyable adaptation. Yeah, some parts can be frustrating, but there are plenty of easy stages to keep you from completely losing your head. It has a Spongebob-appropriate plot, lets you take a trip to your favorite locations, and has a strong sense of nostalgia when you look back at it today. I'd say Super Sponge was a good one. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.